Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Let's Talk Yoga podcast. I always start with something like, I hope you're doing well. And, and this week, I really mean it. I know the COVID numbers are rising like crazy across the US and, and even Canada from what I hear. And everything is barely open and it's closing again. And I'm, I'm just thinking of all of you, especially to some of our listeners in New York State. I know that studios haven't been able to open since March and it's getting really, really challenging for so many of us. And not just yoga teachers, but small businesses in general. So just thinking of you. And I hope you're doing whatever you can to take care of yourself in whatever way possible. Okay, so just wanted to start with that. Now, speaking of today's episode, my guest is Colin Hall. I discovered him recently when I stumbled upon his podcast that was made in collaboration with Yoga International. And it's called the Yoga History Podcast. Colin has an extensive background in religious study and philosophy. He works as a professor at a university and he's a yoga teacher and runs a little yoga studio up in Canada. So usually when we think of history, right, we think of it as being dry, boring lectures. But Colin's podcast really surprised me. He has this amazing sense of humor and he tells stories throughout his podcast. And the day I heard episode one of the Yoga History podcast, I knew I had to have him on. I was looking for someone who would help weave the journey of yoga in in America or North America and what that transition was like, what happened in the last hundred years. I was just curious and I had a lot of questions. And Colin was perfect for this. I have been laughing listening to his podcast and he packs so much great information and research into it. You have to give it a listen. I'll link it in the show notes. It can be found at letstalk.yoga. And again, Colin's podcast is called the Yoga History Podcast. And in today's episode, we trace the journey of yoga in North America. We talk about Is there a clear point of entry of yoga into the Western world? We look at the use of psychedelics in yoga. I ask him about legends of yoga. There's so much we get into and we we had a blast. At least I did. I was laughing even after we turned off the microphone. I just, it was so much fun to talk to Colin. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm really excited for this one. And the one thing I missed out in this episode was... I wanted to get Colin to talk about some resources that you and I can access as yoga teachers and students. So he gave me that after the microphones were switched off and I will link those in the show notes again at letstalk.yoga. Okay, I'm doing a slightly longer intro than I'm used to, but there's one last thing I want to to cover before I let Colin take over. And It kind of makes me uncomfortable to ask for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Shameless plug, especially to all our regular listeners who come back week after week. And I see you sharing the podcast on Instagram and tagging us. I'm so excited that you do it. But for for anyone who's, who's not supporting us, I'd really like for you to like rate and review this on Apple Podcasts. It seriously takes less than 30 seconds to do so. And if you need any help figuring this out, I would love to help you out. Just find me on Instagram at Arundhati Bait Mangalkar and I will help you write us a review and leave us a rating. I look at this podcast as my way of serving the yoga community at large. Okay. And It's not easy to create and produce a podcast. It certainly is not free. So a review, a rating goes a long, long way. Okay. So yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to share. And it seriously makes me so uncomfortable talking about it. Every week I just, I think about it and I'm like, ah, I'll just stuff it in there. But this time I was like, take a deep breath and say it. Okay. So anyway, I appreciate any support you can show us. I hope you enjoy this episode with Colin Hall and I'll see you on the other side. Hi, my name is Arundhati and you're listening to the Let's Talk Yoga podcast. 
I'm an ex-Bollywood dancer turned yoga and wellness educator. I've built a six-figure business as an immigrant, woman of color yoga teacher with no business background, no handstands, pure instinct and the free information found on Google. If you love doing yoga and you dream of teaching it someday, this podcast is for you. We go over everything from doing and teaching yoga to scaling a small business, living a modern yoga lifestyle and so much more. You'll find interesting, fun, raw conversations along with some tips, tricks, strategies and insights in this podcast. So grab your cup of chai and let's jump in. Hi Colin, welcome to the Let's Talk Yoga podcast. Hello there. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I want to share a story with you of how I discovered you and your podcast that that we'll be talking about about let's say during the pandemic i randomly picked up my phone one day and i was like let's see if i can find a podcast about yoga history or at least a few episodes and i just i was so surprised when i found this full podcast that was talking about yoga history and i've loved history when i was in school and college it was one of my favorite subjects so I'm so glad I found it. Did you always love history or was it yoga that got you interested in the history side of it? I would say that I have always been into storytelling. I'm just a a really big fan of of music that has stories to it. I've I've always just loved mythology and that was really the thing that sparked me from from a very young age well before I was ever into yoga. So I guess you could say I've always been into history and then the yoga came later. Yeah, if, I mean, really, it's just sort of a, the, the two things kind of come together for me. Teaching yoga, I, I think without a little bit of storytelling and without some of the rich history of yoga feels kind of flat to me. It just feels like uh, it's it's missing quite a lot. So, so. When did you actually start yoga, Colin? Tell us a little bit about how you made your way to yoga. Sure. Yeah, I, I, took, I took the opposite path that most people take. So most people will take a, a, uh, like an asana class where they're doing postures. And w- once they get a little bit more into it, then they, they start getting into more of the meditation and then the philosophy and all that stuff comes after. And, and I did, it was the exact opposite. I, I, was in, I was in university taking a religious studies class and my professor, and I'm not even sure why, but my professor pulled me aside and said, hey, here's a book I think you should read. Oh, wow. It was the Yoga Sutras. So this was this was back probably 1995 or 1996, and I read that book. I had never done yoga before. I had never meditated. I read the book, and and I it just clicked. I, I was like, this is so good, and it, it really. I, I dropped. I was in I was in journalism at the time. I dropped journalism in order to start to doing religious studies full time, and. After about five years of studying yoga academically, I decided it was time to actually take a class. So about five years later, I took my first yoga class and became a teacher a few years later after that. So it, I, I got into the, the really the, the philosophy and history stuff came first for me. And the, the postures came quite a bit later. That's fascinating. I don't think I've ever spoken to anybody who started asana after being exposed to the philosophy side of it. So what were your first impressions of the Yoga Sutras? Just, I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, at the time, I I was pretty young. I was probably 19 years old. And I, I was really, I was just in, I was into anything different and new and exciting. And I just, I, I had, I had a big imagination and I was just really excited about learning things. And so I had always thought of myself as a bit of an outlier. I, I, was, I was christened in, in a church and I, I went to church when I was a kid, but religion, spirituality, all of that, it never really did much for me. I never thought of myself as a spiritual person at all. And when I, when I read the Yoga Sutras, I was like, 
people have been doing this stuff, like the same, the same kind of things that I think that I thought made me such a weirdo. There's like a whole tradition. There's like a whole history of people that think like this. And so it was in, in it was very, I'm not sure what the word is for it, but it, it felt like coming home. It just felt like very validating. That's the word for it. I felt like finally I've found uh, a, a spiritual tradition or a, a philosophical tradition that really sort of matches what I have been feeling. So it, it really, it, it drove quite a passion for me very quickly. Like it did, it did not take long at all. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, I was just thinking when I was 19, I don't think I had the mental capability to go through the yoga sutras from start to finish. So that's well, really fascinating. I mean, I had help. I had, I had, I had a, a religious studies professor that was kind of guiding me through. And I think that really, I'm not sure had he just handed me the book and said, read it. I'm not sure it would have had the same effect. So very, very important, I think, to have some guidance along the way. Do you know who wrote the copy that you were reading? I do. I do, actually. It was uh, Vishnu Devananda's translation. Ah, okay. Okay. And since I have, <laughs> I, I don't know how many translations and commentaries I have now, but it's funny because that is actually one of my least favorite. <laughs> it's probably oh. one, of the, it's one of the ones that I, I enjoy reading the least. But, but yeah, at the time, it was everything. I read it and I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> Do you have a favorite Yoga Sutra that you do you go back to often? Yeah, prob my favorite currently is is from a guy at the University of Toronto. His name is his name is Shyam Ranganathan, and it is beautifully written. Just so he's really managed to capture that sort of sutra format, and yeah, the the commentary is very. What's the word? I'm, I'm struggling for words here today. Very no, <laughs> it's very no nonsense. You know, Ooh, like it, nice. it, he doesn't add a lot. He basically just like translates the words and says, "Here's what the other commentators have said this means." And there's there's very little added. So when you you know you you read something like Iyengar's translation, oh, he is very liberal. Uh, he, he adds a lot to that text and really makes it, he attempts to make it more about asana practice that comes through very, very clearly. And, and I think most, most translators and commentators have a hard time avoiding that where they, they put a lot of themselves into the commentary. And yeah, Ranganathan just does such a brilliant job of not doing that. I'm actually going to look it up. I've been looking for like different copies to go through and see which one really resonates well with me. So I'm I'm going to check it out. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping we could dive into a conversation about just the journey of yoga in in North America. Let's do and, it. And I've been curious about it over the years. I've lived in India my whole life. Eight years ago, we moved to Seattle, and now this is home. So, and I, I loved your podcast. I think I've said that 10 times already. <laughs> so I'm going to say it another 10 times. I'm just going to put it out there. And, and I'll tell you what I loved about it. It's your sense of humor that really brings, I think, each episode alive. Like I have to really try to be funny and, and get the timing right. I just can't. So, <laughs> and history usually, right? A lot of people think it's like dry and boring, but you do a great job of it. So, sorry, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Oh, you know what? I, I was just going to say that I, I have the exact same feeling is that the, the classes and lectures and subjects that I remember most clearly are always the ones where I'm enjoying myself. It's always like when, I, when I'm having a good time listening to something, it sticks. And so I really, I wanted to go out of my way to make sure it wasn't just informative I wanted to make sure the research is there and that it is informative, but not just informative for me. It had to be entertaining. It had to be fun to listen to. So I'm really glad you picked up on that. <laughs> it was. And the storytelling was great too. So for, for anyone listening, right, where does yoga make its entry into the Western world? Would this be with Swami Vivekananda's speech in 1893 or is there another clear entry point? Well, you know, I, I have I have kind of an, an interesting take on this that I think is not particularly common. And, and that's that my my feeling is that this 
Eastern and Western thing might be a bad starting place. Those might not be two very good categories to use. Okay. Because the, 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 there was never really a clear distinction between the East and the West, particularly when it comes to India. So, you know, you have Greek kings in India as far back as 100 BCE. So one, of the, one of the most famous kings is, his name is Melinda, which is funny, but some, yeah, sometimes called Menander. So you have this, this exchange of cultures it, it, between the, the Greeks who people look at as sort of the, the founders of Western democracy. The, the Greeks and the Indians really had a, a long-term, not a short exchange, but a long-term exchange. And even after Alexander the Great got his ass handed to him, because he really did, <laughs> he showed up. <laughs> he had no idea about war elephants. That was a uh-huh. surprise to him. <laughs> so he showed up and got his ass kicked and went back to Greece. But he left a lot of soldiers behind. And so there was a lot of Greek people in India, particularly in northern India. You know, after that, we, there's a lot of trade between the Roman Empire and India. There's, there's ships going back and forth constantly, and those ships have people on them. And so there, I think there has been an exchange of ideas between what we call the East and the West for thousands of years. And so, you know, I... I I think that it's fair to say Vivekananda really kind of like broke through and and started to establish, I think you could maybe call it like a Western school of yoga, uh, a Western approach to yoga. But, but in my mind, it's, it's really the, the, it's very difficult to kind of parse or separate, you know, where, where, where do we draw a line between what is East and what is West. And, and I know a lot of people have said it's, it's Turkey, right? It's Istanbul. <laughs> but for, for me, I, I just don't see that line, especially intellectually. And when it comes to literature and philosophy, I think that that is just not, a, it just doesn't work very well. But <laughs> so that's, that's all just me being like, yada, yada, yada. No, fair um, enough. Yeah. But uh, there, there is there is some connection, I think, of of yoga sort of in its journey to the West pre Vivekananda, and there's two there's two really good examples. One is there there's the queen the Queen of England, uh, the Queen Victoria. She had a a a like a spiritual master who was a yoga teacher. Uh, his name is Shiva Puri Baba. And, and she used to bring him to England regularly to learn yoga from him. And this goes back like 1860s, 1870s, like way, oh, way wow. back. Yeah. And so there, there's definitely a tradition of, of Indian yoga teachers traveling west pre-Vivekananda. And if, if we don't insist on a teacher traveling along with it, Definitely very important literary movement in America is the, the transcendentalists. So, you know, it's got like a, I, I always want to throw Walt Whitman in there, but probably shouldn't. But, oh, my brain, my brain again, just, just stopped. Walden on Walden Pond is, is the book and, and the author whose name is, I'm just blanking on for a second, very, very much influenced by the Bhagavad Gita. And it's this this literary tradition, Thoreau. I can't believe that took me so long to come up with. <laughs> <laughs> but Thoreau really led a, a tradition of writing in America that was absolutely just based on the Bhagavad Gita and, and that sort of that that view of the world that was not a Judeo Christian view. And, and so I think that even if people weren't necessarily studying yoga, taking yoga classes, reading translations of the Bhagavad Gita, if they were if they were reading work by these transcendentalists like Thoreau, a- absolutely they were being exposed to yoga ideas and concepts and, and starting to sort of become more, we would say, like a yogi. But but absolutely. Uh, Vivekananda, he, he, there's no doubt, really sort of made it, made a splash and 
I, I would say is maybe maybe the the great popularizer. Maybe maybe not the one that introduced it, but definitely one the one that introduced it the best. <laughs> I think also right what happens with at least modern yoga and teacher trainings is you only hear just a part of what's actually happened and that's how i think you hear of names like swami vivekananda while there are others who came before you just hear of a few people instead of like a long list because we don't study it the way it should be studied so i get it this is actually great i read something about a lot of the britishers who not a lot but a few british i wouldn't call them soldiers but people who worked for the queen they used to study the bhagavad gita and it actually made its way across the seas sometime in the 1800s and stuff like that so oh, yeah. so thank you for that yeah you know if and if people are interested just to sort of th- just to throw this in there for people if if they look up his, his pen name that he used all the time was Arthur Avalon his his name was George Woodruff but but he really he did a lot of work uh translating tantric and, and other hindu texts and this again is like he, he started his work in the the mid 1800s and you know he he spent a ton of time in india one of his most famous book is the serpent power which is a, a, all about sort of kundalini, kundalini? Yoga. Mm-hmm. yeah and yeah it's it, the there there were a boatload of people in india Westerners in India who were definitely interested and, and were were starting this sort of project of bringing yoga into the Western mind, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been happening for quite a long time now. <laughs> so, do you think the West is again? I know we said we don't want to use East and West, but do <laughs> yeah. you think I'm just going to use it for sake of yeah, convenience yeah, of course, right now? Of course, yeah. Do you think the Western world is fascinated by the East or is that, I mean, when I lived in India, right, we used to be fascinated by a lot of things from the Western world. So it just seems like the grass is greener on the other side. Yes, for sure. It's interesting, you know, it, it takes the form of what, what people call Orientalism a lot, a lot of the time where it is a, a romantic fascination with the East that on the surface seems complementary like it seems it's when when you look at it it looks like essentially white people admiring and and appreciating the orient eastern culture generally speaking but you know it doesn't take long when when you start sort of peeling back the layers a little bit what you see is this orientalist attitude of basically whatever the west is not that's what the east is and so it's there, there is definitely this fascination but in in a lot of ways it becomes a uh, a way of defining uh, a culture that it works it very much works hand in hand with colonialism where it, it seems this is what what people get so confused about these ideas of of appreciation versus appropriation because one one leads into the other so quickly and it's it's something that as soon as you start looking for it you start seeing it everywhere if you if you're not looking for it though you, you'll you, never see it yeah you don't see it it just looks like white people who are really into yoga and they're just like oh this is fascinating this is just what how could that possibly be bad you know it, it, it doesn't take very long though before you're like Oh. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> that's your deal. You you want to sort of place what you think, about, you know, this is this is this classic idea of like, you know what? People in India, they're poor, but they're so happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you get yeah. that. You get that all the time and uh I've heard that, yeah. Yeah, it it drives me bananas. <laughs> I know. I know I've heard it like too often and it's a really fine line like you mentioned between appropriation and appreciation but i'm going to stay away from that if possible because oh, yeah. it take us a For little sure. out there so i want to come to i'm going to do a like it's like a big jump i'm going to take right now when do you think postural yoga became prominent because from my naive understanding yoga about 40 years ago out here or maybe even 50 years ago there was a lot more of philosophy and other practices than just poses but somewhere along the line it became very fitnessy so 
What do you have to say about this, Colin? Well, I think it depends how far back you want to go. You it, decide. <laughs> I, I think that there is definitely a, a tradition of yoga as fitness, uh, yoga as exercise that goes back well before yoga was popularized in America. And I think it's not hard to find. I think if you look at the lineage that Bikram yogis claim, uh, that sort of gauche lineage, that that is very much the, it, the, the line, you know, the line that distinguishes bodybuilding from yoga in that lineage is pretty thin. Bodybuilding and yoga are seen as two very similar things. And so there, there's that tradition that I think is important to keep in mind. You have, I think, also one of the most influential sort of early popularizers of what we could call Western or like maybe commercial yoga is uh, Pierre Bernard and is his partner, Blanche de Vries. And while they definitely were into philosophy and meditation and, and more, more than just postures, for them, I, I think yoga, yoga almost did take the form of a kind of performance. It was a show that you put on and they did, they organized shows, but you know, I do, I do like to, uh, for, for me, I think it's, it's important to recognize that while, while there is this sort of performative aspect that you see in what we call sort of Western yoga traditions, I think that's there primarily as a, as a, as a response to the yoga that was introduced first to America had a very performative element to it. And I'll, I'll go back to say like Krishnamacharya who a, a lot of a lot of what he did a lot of his work was organizing shows they they put together these little yoga shows and would tour for the king yeah and, yeah. and they would tour yeah. from uh from town to town and they they called them propaganda tours and it was they they roll out all these kids doing crazy postures on stage and all the audience is like this is amazing and it was it was really done as a kind of a, a a way to promote Indian nationalism and Indian independence. And I think, I think we can all kind of get behind that. <laughs> and so you have then a very similar tradition of, of performative yoga that gets adopted by yoga teachers in America, but then rather than having it in the service of Indian independence, it becomes in the service of money. Right. So it's it, the, the, that sort of yoga as asana or yoga as physical performance thing dates back much, much further than yoga in North America. It just, to, to me, it becomes kind of a little bit more gross mm -hmm. in America <laughs> because it gets so much, so commercialized. Uh -huh. So, so going back to something you spoke about the gauche lineage, what about Krishnamacharya? In, in all of this. Didn't that happen a little before the Ghosh lineage or around the same time? It was very similar, very similar time. And I think that Krishnamacharya definitely would have been influenced by this sort of workout culture in India at the time. Very, very popular to go to, go to YMCAs and be doing workouts and be just basic, essentially trying to get jacked, right? Looking to get, to get big and strong. And I, I think absolutely Krishnamacharya would have been influenced by a lot of the same teachers that Bishnu Ghosh was influenced by. And slightly off topic, but you said bodybuilding, right? I want to know, and I've read a little bit about this and heard it here and there. What's the connection between yoga and gymnastics? Is there a connection? Yes. <laughs> well, okay. So this is, this is thin ice. Okay, because because we don't we don't really have and I, I've asked these questions in India to people who I think would know, and I haven't really received a lot of straight answers. I bet. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've, I this is a, a little bit of speculation. I know I know this in the 1920s there was a all India YMCA conference that Krishnamacharya attended. And there was a gymnastics teacher who attended that conference 
and and demonstrated his form of what he called serial gymnastics. So gymnastics that are taught in a sequence. So essentially you do this posture, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. And you teach this as a sequence to people. And, and that's a way to do these sort of group fitness activities. Perfect for YMCAs. And this happened at the same time that Krishnamacharya was digging into these old medieval tantric hatha yoga manuals. And it sure seems like he was influenced by it. Now, again, I can't find direct links there, but, but it, sure, it sure seems like, for example, this sort of uh, sequence of triangle, side angle, warrior two, that, that sequence of postures, that seems to be influenced pretty heavily by gymnastics. Ah, uh, okay. Fascinating. I've never heard that before, and that's fascinating. And I can actually see it's probably very possible too. Yeah. I mean, and I just, just to, because this is very speculative, my, my reasoning, if people are like, why would you think side angle and, and, and triangle come from gymnastics? Essentially, when you look, you look, look for, look, search for triangle pose. Just look for it, not on Google, but like, look for that shape of people making that shape with their body. Look for any indication that you can find for that posture in literature, in, in art, in, in sculpture, Let's search for it. I can't find it. I do find in, I think it's the late 1700s, a text where they talk about triangle pose. But when they describe it, they're describing a seated posture, not triangle as we know it now. And so there are photos of, of, this, of this European doing a gymnastic system that show people doing triangle the way we do it now. And so Krishnamacharya meets this guy, does his style of yoga. And now, all of a sudden, now I'm seeing photos of people doing triangle pose. So that's where, that's where I'm making that leap. And it is a bit of a leap. But, you know, it, when I asked Deskachar, who's Krishnamacharya's son, I met him, oh, geez, now 10, 12 years ago. And when I asked him, he basically gave me this death glare that was like. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you ask this? Exactly. You have asked the wrong question, young man. <laughs> I, I was just thinking as you were saying this, that if you ask anybody from that lineage, they will deny that anything came from gymnastics because, yeah, I don't know why, but yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense. If, if Krishnamacharya is being employed by his king to teach yoga as a way of bolstering a sense of Indian pride and nationalism and independence, the last thing in the world you want is to say, oh, yeah, and by the way, this posture <laughs> came from a European. So, oh, yeah. gosh, he would lose his job right away. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. So it, does, it makes a lot of sense. I, I understand. I, I think at this point, it, it would be awesome if if some of those lineage holders and people inside of those traditions could like open up a little bit and just be like, okay, here's what actually happened. I, <laughs> I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I, though. Yeah, pro probably not. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to, again, take another leap here. And I want to talk to you about something I've been asked about, and I don't really know much or anything about it, is the the correlation between the use of psychedelics and yoga and the roaring 60s and the hippies, what does all of that have to do with yoga's growth in North America? Well, I think quite a lot, actually. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's a whole episode on it on the Yoga History Podcast. So. I know, and I'll link to all of it. <laughs> so if maybe I'll just give people the short version. Yes, please. Of that. And that's that there, there was during the 1960s and, and 1970s, a very strong countercultural movement that was all about sort of questioning, essentially, the American dream, 
and the role of, of Western institutions and structures that, that for the most part, particularly in the 1950s, no one ever questioned. It, it was just, it was a given. Obviously, you go to school, get married, get a job, get a house, get a family, then you retire. Mm-hmm. What That's more, how I was raised too. You yeah. Know? <laughs> what what yeah. more could you want? And in the 60s and 70s, there was a big movement of people that were like, you know what? I don't know what more I might want. So let's do things that might open our minds up to new possibilities. Now, psychedelics were one of those things. Protests were definitely one of those things. And yoga was also one of those things. So did, did yoga and psychedelics really sort of, did they inform one another? I'm not sure. But they were being practiced by the same people, right? The, 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 the people that really in the 60s and 70s led that kind of hippie countercultural Woodstock thing that, that really changed not only politics, but just society, generally speaking, in America, they, generally speaking, they, they were doing yoga and acid. And so I know that the more sort of traditionalist teachers from India did not think that was either, either thought it was kind of harmless, but silly, or just thought flat out, we're like, that's bad, wrong, don't do it. And for the most part, it was those more sort of conservative voices that won out. And, and as a result, these days, if you are at a yoga class, and I mean, we, we don't go to yoga classes anymore. That <laughs> <laughs> we, we take them in our living rooms now. But, you know, last year, if you went to a yoga class and you said, hey, after yoga, would you like to do some LSD with me? People would shake their heads. People would be like, what the, what are you talking about? Like, that's bananas. In 1971, that would not have been bananas. That, that would oh, have wow. been perfectly normal. And, you know, it's, I, I think that it's really interesting to, to, to think of yoga and meditation as an exploration of consciousness. Both of those, they, they, they are ways to sort of explore inner worlds. And if, if, if we're okay with that as a definition then the use of psychedelics doesn't seem quite so far out, right? It, it does seem like a shortcut and maybe a bit of a cheat code, but yeah, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to me like we should be very shocked. And I think people are coming around to that right now in terms of using psychedelic mushrooms as a form of therapy for dealing with trauma. And I, I think that, I think that in many ways we might be headed back for another another 1971 kind of year where I, I feel like yoga and psychedelics might meet again sometime in the near future. Oh, interesting. And I'm not I'm not really sure of this a hundred percent, but from my understanding, even in Indian history, like the kings and they had access to some amount of psychedelics. I, I I'm making a blanket statement here, but in Holi, in, in that festival of colors, people drink bhang. Now, that's not a psychedelic, but there was well, some form I mean, of it. Kind of. Have you? I mean, I don't, we don't need to get it. I mean, no, it's legal in Saskatchewan. It's legal in Canada. And it's legal in Washington State. So I can say, <laughs> I, can <do> it. <laughs> I, I, have, I have tried bhang and I can confirm it is a little bit psychedelic. Is it? Yeah. Smoking cannabis is not psychedelic at all. But when you eat it, it is It is quite a, it's a bit of a trip. <laughs> I, I drank bhang once sometime in college because we were playing holy and nothing happened. And I was like, what is this? Well, lucky you. <laughs> that was not my experience at all. <laughs> I, I, I have, I'm pretty sure I just drank something that, someone made up which had nothing in it but yeah. <laughs> anyway so another leap here when I some of my teacher trainees and students they tell me their first experience of yoga or they discovered it when say Jennifer Aniston or some other Hollywood celebrity started doing yoga and so what's the role of 
the of Hollywood and this glamour side of it. Does that is that a big part of yoga's journey? Absolutely, uh, is especially in America. So the way the way I look at this stuff is that I don't know that we would have heard of Krishnamacharya were it not for the 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 king the the, the Wodiar family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if not for the Wodiars, I don't think that we know who Krishnamacharya is. It was their patronage Absolutely. that made him who he is. Now, who are the royal families in America? Who? I don't know. It's it's Hollywood. Oh, okay. I should have guessed that. You know what I, I mean? Totally that. Yeah. It really is. It, it, is, it, is these, it is these Hollywood celebrities. They are royalty. True, true. And, and so, again... It, it makes perfect sense. Why do we know the name Indra Devi? He, people bring up the name Indra Devi as though she's like this sort of feminist superpower who reintroduced women into yoga. Like, give me a break. Is that true? No. I've, <laughs> no, absolutely not. I have it in my notes here because I know th- there are pictures of her with Marilyn Monroe wearing a sari. I read her, what was that? The Goddess Pose, the book about her life story. I don't know how much of it is true and how much of it is just hype. It's absolutely hype. I mean, she she got famous by teaching famous people. So we know about Krishnamacharya because the Wodiar family. We know about Indra Devi because of Marilyn Monroe. And take Marilyn Monroe out of that equation, we definitely are not going to be saying anything about Indra Devi being this icon who improve yoga for women and and what what, i mean it borders on absurd really like even you don't even i mean you you can find women teaching yoga in india now are they super duper famous no no not at all they're not but like i i know i know for a fact that so many people learned yoga from their grandma (laughs) Yes, yes. So many people did. And so there, there absolutely were yoga teachers in India before Indra Devi got famous. There's no question about that. But even in America, Blanche DeVries was teaching yoga. She opened a yoga studio in New York in 1918. Oh, I That's didn't know that. That's over 100 years ago. And that was 50, well, not 50, but that was, <laughs> that was 30 years before Indra Devi shows up. That's you know, a long time. It really is. It really is. I mean, it's it's as though, you know, I take credit and I'm like, I'm the first person to run a yoga studio in Saskatchewan when there was a yoga studio here 30 years ago. It, it would be absurd. I, I would get laughed out of the city. But again, this is, you know, you brought up a really, really good point and it's something I've been waiting to come back to. And here's the perfect opportunity. Our, our, history and philosophy portions of our teacher trainings are rushed. We get, what is it? 10, 15 hours, something like that. At best. Yeah. And then you got to, you got to, you got to get through the Bhagavad Gita. You got to get through the yoga sutras. How much time is left for the history of modern yoga? 25 minutes. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And so, and so what do you do? You know, here's here's yamas, niyamas, asana, pranayama. You run through the eight limbs. Here, you know, you got the three the three paths in the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, we got that. Oh, and by the way, Indra Devi, she's the queen of yoga, and she's a feminist superpower. Okay, done. <laughs> Let's go back to learning side angle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and and I'm I'm trying not to say much because I'm trying to stay away from why yoga teacher trainings are just that whole system. That's a yeah, it needs to be redone so badly. But you're right. It's just not possible to cover all that we actually need to cover. Yeah. I mean, and so in the, in the meantime, then, it falls to the individual, right? If, if the training isn't there and it's not institutionalized in any way, then it falls to the individual. You get your 200-hour certification, and now you get your ass into a library, Right. Start reading because you have way more to cover. But don't you think it's also just sometimes a lot of yoga teachers or people who end up in these trainings, they just they're there for 
honestly just the poses and they don't care about anything else and i feel like that's i don't really have a question i'm just <laughs> venting statement. no it's i'm i'm venting probably it's, it's true but you know what and i i this is i feel i feel this way in university classes as well as in yoga classes i don't i don't think that anybody can listen to the history of yoga hear these stories be and be immersed in this stuff by somebody who cares and somebody who's passionate about it and not get excited you know what i mean and so it while while yes i i said it and i stand by it it falls to the individual that if the trainings aren't there these people you individual yoga teachers need to step up and take learning the Absolutely. history more seriously for sure but yoga teachers people who are teaching the philosophy they need to do better i'll say we oh, need yes. we need to do better we we need to inspire and actually teach this stuff in a way that connects in a way that lands instead of running up a freaking powerpoint with the eight limbs on it over and over and over again <laughs> 100% i agree with you the bar for teacher trainers or lead trainers or whatever we call them has to be super high and i think it's been way too low for the past few decades and more so i'm i'm with you if if trainees don't know something or even teachers don't know something i always say look who taught them who came above them first and that's where the problem is and then look beyond that but Yeah no I agree with you I'm just nodding my head so hard I think I'll bump my head on this microphone <laughs> right now so oh, okay so I'm going to I'm going to slowly start to wrap this up because there's so much in your podcast and I'm really hoping after people listen to this they'll jump off and go listen to all of that couple of questions for you about your yoga history podcast is there a season 2 I mean I don't know if <laughs> There is there is I'm uh, I'm writing season 2 right now and I um you know I didn't know I didn't know what was going to happen with this podcast I I had had an idea for it and I, and I pitched it How did it come about I I think honestly I I have some really good friends at Yoga International Mhm mm I actually have a lot of respect for them they do they do some really good work They're incredible people they really are and so i had been teaching some classes for them and i think it was just an email i think i just sent an email and said hey i've got an idea for a podcast ah. what do you think and they were kind enough to say yeah let's do it so i didn't know what was going to happen when when i wrote season 1 and i wrote i wrote it first it's the you know when you look at the text because it's all written down it's the better part of a book like it is i know there's a lot of writing there i was going to ask you how much prep time i mean you do a great job of just like getting everything in there or you edited a lot of stuff i don't know there's no editing <laughs> i do a lot of editing when i write but those what you listen what you listening to there now there's a little bit of post post production where our my my producer Kyle will go in and add sound effects and make it fun i love those yeah, i love too. those me too but i honestly i sit down with a microphone and i just i just read what's on the paper and i i stop and i kind of go off off the cuff occasionally that's mostly that's the storytelling bit but for the most part yeah it's just it's just reading what i wrote the thing with season 2 and, and the reason it's taking me a little while is that and, and i hope this doesn't sound bad at all i'm going to do my best to not have this sound too bad but I loved season 1. I thought <laughs> I thought it was so good. Like I, I honestly I'm I glad I'm not the only one saying it. <laughs> I didn't I didn't expect it to turn out as good as it did. I was just kind of goofing around and kind of throwing so I, I had a bunch of research and I was just writing some stuff. I was like, let's see what happens. Well, the finished product when it came out, I was like, damn. Yeah, it was good. This is good. And so now I feel like some pressure to make sure season 2 is really really good and so it's it's sort of slowing me down a little bit. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, well I hope I hope 2021 brings out season 2 or whenever you decide to put it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Colin, I feel like there's so much more we can jump into and and you've done such an amazing job of just making it accessible because 
sometimes I feel like yoga teachers, when I talk about history and legends of yoga, and they just roll their eyes at me because they're like, I'm not going to read that book. And I'm like, but if you want to know, you can't expect someone else to give you that knowledge. You've got to go and read it and do the work. And I think your podcast will be a great start point to get people in the door. I sure hope so. I, of really exploring the history of yoga. And, and there's so much there that one can be excited about. So, but before I let you go, where can people find you, connect with you, other than the podcasts that are linked to? Yeah, probably the simplest thing to do if people are on Instagram, just to find me at Colin Yogan. And, you know, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're still one of the few that are still on Facebook, I'm there to <laughs> search, search for Colin Hall on Facebook. You can find me there. I don't have a website. You don't? I do not. So, yeah, there's no, there's no web address to give. What um, about your yoga studio? Don't you have one? Well, I, do have a, I do have a yoga studio here in Regina. So that's bodhitreeyoga.com. But, you know, that, that, that's, really, that's really focused at my community here in Regina, Saskatchewan. You know, I, I live in a, a small city and I, uh, a small neighborhood in my city. And that's, that's really where we focus is I've always thought of our yoga studio more as a community center. Than, than, a, than a business. It certainly doesn't run like a business. <laughs> so yeah, I think, you know, when, when people are not in Regina and they, they, go, they go to the website, it's very clear that this is like, this is aimed, this is targeted for people from Regina. Got it. Okay. So uh, one last question um, before I let you go. Is teaching yoga your full-time job? I'm just wondering because you said you don't run the studio it's as, as a studio and more as a community thing. Yeah, no, I don't. I have a, I make, I make sure that I have a job outside of yoga. Nice. Okay. I, yeah, I, and this is, this is a, this is a conscious decision that my wife and I have made is that we, we don't want to ever get put in a position where we have to compromise what we believe in, what we believe to be true about yoga in order to pay our bills. So I, I, I'll, I just make sure. So I, I work at the university as a lecturer and among, among some other gigs that I hold down just to pay the mortgage and, and to, uh, to put food on the table. And then if, if the yoga studio happens to make money, which not in 2020, oh, yeah. <laughs> but if it happens to make money, that's cool. That's great. But I, I don't want my family depending on that. I don't think that's a very good idea. I hear you. I, I absolutely hear you. And I've, I've given this same advice to a lot of teachers saying, if you have to compromise your yoga to survive, then you need to get another job and, and not rely on this. So, so it's yeah, har it's harsh. That is a, that is, is. A, that is a bitter, bitter pill. And I wish that was not the case. I would love to just teach yoga full time and only teach yoga. That'd be amazing. But I, I think it, I think it opens you up to some problems. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, but thank you for that. I think it's it's always good to hear it. And the more you hear it, the more kind of it, it helps people. So yeah. Thank you so much, Colin. And when season come season two comes out, <laughs> I'm <laughs> hoping you'll be back. <laughs> I would absolutely love to come back for another talk at a great time with you. Uh you're you're a blast to talk to. You ask really good questions. And so I really, I really appreciate, really appreciate you taking the time to have me on. It's a great pleasure. Thank you, Colin. Thanks for listening. As always, the show notes are available at letstalk.yoga. I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.